pervasive communications. It's a concept that I've been working on for a couple of years with a colleague of mine, Alan Bergson. We both approached it from different perspectives, and our history with it goes back decades. We grew up in a time when technology was evolving, where communications was really starting to take off. And over the past few decades, we've both witnessed changes in human behavior and changes in technology. And when we started to think about this together, we started to form some common thoughts and ideas. And even though we were approaching it from different perspectives, we both added value to the equation. And the result of that was pervasive communications, the state of now. So where are we in the state of now? We live in a hyper-connected, ubiquitous, non-linear, and chaotic era of communications. This is the first time ever that we've lived in such a state. Never before has this happened. And what's interesting is it's rewiring our brains, our ability to be anywhere in the world, our ability to communicate with anybody anywhere. Think about it for a moment. Five years ago, how many people would have attended an event like this, listened to what somebody said on the stage, and had the urge to get up out of their seat, walk out of the hall, outside, and shout at the top of their lungs so that everybody could hear, this person just said this, and broadcast it to everybody that they know and everybody that they don't know. And yet today, how many people are sitting in here tweeting what's taking place? How many people are sharing their perspectives, their ideas, their thoughts? We can see it here on this screen, it's taking place. And that same cell phone that we use, the iPhone that was invented in 2007, only five years ago, how many of you actually sleep next to your phone? Come on, raise of hands. Okay, I think that's just about everybody. All right, so if I expand it to Droid, and since we're in Canada, I'll include Blackberries. Okay, we've got about 100% coverage. How many people actually check social media the first thing in the morning? Okay, pretty good, about 90%, with 10% being very shy and reluctant to raise their hands. How many people actually answer their phone in the middle of the night when it rings? to see who sent them a message. Come on, be honest. Okay. So let's go back even further. Let's go back 50 years. Let's take it out of the digital realm and let's put it into the here and now realm, the physical realm. How many people 50 years ago would have thought to wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to check TWA's flight schedule? and I'm gonna see what flight I can get so that I can fly across the country, or maybe even better yet, to another country, so that I can stand up in front of a group of people and speak for 10 minutes. And when I'm done, I'm gonna leave here, and I'm gonna go back to Syracuse, visit my mother, and then from there, travel to New York for an hour-long meeting. And when I'm done with that, go back to Virginia for the night, and then go back again to New York. We would never have thought about that. And yet today, it's second nature. Our brains have been rewired. And that's an important thing, an incredibly important thing. And it's core to understanding pervasive communications. So if we think about pervasive communications, it's part of our DNA. It's who we are. Our desire to create all of these communications mechanisms goes all the way back to the Stone Age, to cave paintings. We've always found a way to communicate. As we expanded as a, a species, no matter how far we went, we found some way to connect back home. As E.T. did, we found a way to call home over and over again. And we left messages for people to tell them where we were at any particular given point in time. It may have been through cave paintings, it may have been through smoke signals. We may have pounded on drums to get the message across. Today, we're using Skype. We're using communication mechanisms that we never dreamt of before. And we're using them in ways that we never thought of before. 
So pervasive communications is not necessarily about the number of communications channels that we have at our disposal, but rather I would say it's about the diversity of communication channels that we have. So let's take a minute, and we have two maps here, one that represents the airline traffic patterns around the world. The other represents Facebook's traffic patterns around the world. Notice the similarities between the two. We're flying to the same places that we're communicating to people with. But each of these communication mechanisms, and I would say that air transportation is a form of communication mechanism. We travel to meet with people. We log on to Facebook to meet with people. It's simply a different way of communicating, but they overlap. And what's really interesting is if we look at Facebook, people think of Facebook as this single, all-encompassing mechanism, this communications channel, and it's really not. I look at the way I use Facebook. I communicate with relatives using Facebook Messenger, and they are their own social graph. They never interact with anybody else that I communicate with on Facebook. There are other people where I do post pictures of my family, my friends, I post what I'm doing or what I have done, or what I'm going to do. And there's a particular group that sees that. But most of my activity on Facebook consists of private groups. At any given time, I'm involved in anywhere from five to 10 different private groups, each with their own unique social graph. And each person within their group has their own perspective and they bring something unique to the conversation. So if we look at this, there's a lot of diversity that's taking place, even within a given social communications channel. So let's look at something really simple. Let's take a look at SMS, text messaging. How many people here still text message? Okay, the majority of people. I text message all the time. In fact, standing behind before this conference, before I came out on stage, I rattled off text messages back and forth with about four or five different people. I'm communicating with them sharing ideas, talking about what's going to happen next. We use text messaging here to communicate back and forth. But go to places where text messaging is used in a different way. Go to Africa where text messaging is used not just to communicate with others, but also as one of the dominant forms of mobile commerce. We're just now getting to the point where we think we're going to start to engage in mobile payments. They're doing it in Africa now using text messaging. They've taken something as simple as SMS and they found a way to use it in a way that we're still lagging behind. They've adapted their behavior to the communication means at their disposal. So if we look at all the people that consist of around the world, the seven billion or so people that are out there, each person has their own unique perspective on the world events. And together, they collectively form something that we call our biological big data. Now, we're very good at collecting big data. We love to collect data, where somebody was, what they did. Credit card companies thrive on it. We collect everything that we can about somebody, where they are, who they're with, what they did, how much they spent for something. And we put it all into these massive databases, and we mine the heck out of it. And we try and figure out the answers to questions that we think are the right questions. But with biological big data, we're talking about your perspective, the way you view something. So in this case here, consider the debates that were held in Egypt earlier this week. This is a historic event, but the perspective of everybody that was involved in that debate is different. There are no two people that have the same perspective. Even the two people debating on the stage have a different perspective from each other. And every person who witnessed the debate, whether they were there in person or whether they saw it on TV or whether we watched it here on television, on the newscast, we have a different perspective. But collectively, that group perspective forms a form of biological big data that we've never had before. And it goes beyond sentiment. It goes beyond that into collective wisdom, collective knowledge, collective perspective, and collective context. Because each person has their own context that they view things through. And that's a very important point. Even in this room, my perspective of this event is different from yours. 
And I'm not looking at what's happening over here on the screen, but I'm sure their perspective is different from Greg's perspective or from Sam's. So there's another aspect of biological big data, the ad hoc interaction that's worth pointing out. Because being able to identify ad hoc social graphs, graphs where people come together for a brief moment in time, are very important. Not because of necessarily what we see at that time, but the way we react. So here we are today in Montreal. So I had to throw up a slide about hockey. I grew up playing hockey. I love the game. I love the sport. And I look at this particular picture here, and that tells me a lot. Here are two individuals, one from the Sharks, one from the Coyotes, whose social graphs have come together in a very physical way. In fact, I'm not quite sure where one ends and one begins. But what's the most interesting thing about this slide? What stands out to you from your perspective? I know for me, it's not the fact that two hockey players are fighting. For me, it's the woman standing there like this, celebrating. Is she a, a Sharks fan? Is she a Coyotes fan? I don't know. In fact, I think she's probably celebrating the fact that there's a fight going on. Her perspective is that unique, that diverse. It lends value to what we see. So she's reacting to an action that's taken place. So without that social graph, that ad hoc social graph between these two hockey players, we never would have seen the glimpse into how this person thinks. And that's something that's very unique. And that's something that's shared globally. Just like this picture was shared across the web, like we share things on YouTube, like we share things on Facebook, on Pinterest, and all the other social channels that we have at our disposal. So every reaction, as we saw in the last slide, starts with an action. Consider this action here, a car accident. We can look at this and we can study it, but it asks more questions than it gives answers. We look at it and we say, there's been an accident. But to me, I look at it and I say, what caused the accident? What happened before this? What was the actual result afterwards? Did this accident change something in our behavior? Or was this accident the result of a change in our behavior? Perhaps somebody was a little bit intoxicated. Perhaps a tire blew out. Perhaps a deer ran across the road. But the only way we're going to find out what actually took place here is to look at everybody's perspective, to talk to everybody involved in the accident, to really truly reconstruct it. That's the only way we can figure out what's actually going on. And that gives us something that takes place over time. The before accident, the accident, and then the post-accident event. And by doing that, we can start to see trends and patterns in this particular location that may shape our thinking moving forward. So how do we do that? I've always been a fan of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And we can apply it to biological big data, just like we can to big data. The more we study an event, a particular event, the individual aspects of it, the less we know about the trends that it's part of. Conversely, the more we look at trends, the less we may lose the insight into individual events. So there's a medium that we have to kind of look at between the two. We have to combine the snapshot of what's happened with what's taken place before and after that. I'm sorry. Sir Isaac Newton, his laws of motion. Brilliant. We know for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. That also helps us put context around an event. In this case, think back to the automobile accident or think back to what's happening here in this crowd. The sum or the balancing force of that action, the equal and opposite reaction, doesn't just come from one person or one event, but it's the collective perspective of everybody that witnesses that event, whether they're there in person or whether they see it online or whether they hear it from a friend. It's a very important point. Now, the other individual on the right, any guesses as to who that is? It's got to be somebody who has a guess. Niels Bohr. 
who famously said, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. One of my favorite quotes, and he's right. We can look at applying the uncertainty principle. We can look at things that are happening and we can look at uh, Newton's law and we can figure out what's happened before and what happened during, but we can't predict what's going to happen next. I could take my cell phone and I could throw it out into the audience here today. I can't predict that somebody's going to catch that phone. But I can say there's a good probability that it's going to be caught. And the more I know about the individuals in this room, the greater the probability is that I can predict it's going to be caught. And based on where I throw it, I might have a better chance of predicting who's actually going to catch it. Now, if I throw it to my three-year-old son, I guarantee you he's not going to catch the phone. It's just not going to happen. But if I throw it to my nine-year-old, he'll probably catch it, just like he does a football. And like a football, he's going to run with it, and I'm never going to see it again. That's his perspective on life. He catches phone, it's his. So, in order to take a look at what's really going on with all these different perspectives and to understand our biological big data and what's taking place and how pervasive communications is impacting our lives, it's important sometimes to step back, to take off the glasses and take a fuzzy look at what we see to not quite fixate on the specific event that we're looking at, but kind of squint at it a little bit, to take a fuzzy look so that we can see the before, the during, and the after. And that's a very important thing, a very important thing. We don't do enough of it, and that's something we need to do right now because we're at the point in our lives, something we've never been at before, where change is the new constant. Everything is changing. We talk about best practices in social media all the time. I see it in every magazine article. I see it online and websites. I have conversations about it with people and they talk about the best practices for this particular social network or the best practices to reach this particular audience. But the reality today is that technology is growing at such a rate, it's exploding at such a rate of development that by the time we actually master a particular communications channel, the chances are pretty good that that channel has already changed. It's maybe become obsolete. Or perhaps the user community that we were trying to target on that channel has already left and moved on to the next communication channel. Even in the case of Facebook, how often does Facebook change their technology, their practices, their algorithms? And it's interesting because we think about timelines. I was talking this morning with somebody about timelines and I said, do you remember a time before timelines? And they paused for a moment and they said, no. <laughs> They've adapted that quickly to the changing technology. So the challenge I would put out to you today is to stop thinking about best practices. Think about pervasive communications in the state of constant change and start thinking about next practices. Start thinking about where we're going to be tomorrow, where we're going to be six months from now. We may not be able to pinpoint that out with great certainty or great accuracy, but if we take a good look at the before, during, and after picture, if we squint at the data and our human behavior in what's taking place in the world today, we could probably get a pretty good idea of where we're likely to be. Thank you very much.